think this is the last morning we're going to deal with um, processing death and getting ready to, or more ready to handle people physically leaving the earth. Um, Kevin had a question last Sunday that I told him to ask right at the beginning this morning. So I'll have him ask it and then I'll repeat it so the online viewers can hear it. The question was, we've been talking about uh, uh, scripture out of James where we should not say that tomorrow we're going to do this or next week we're going to do that. We should say if it's the Lord's will, we will do that and uh, you know, not take for granted we're going to be here. But if we're continually saying, well, I don't know, if I'm here this afternoon, I'll do this, or if I'm not gone tomorrow, or I'm not di died tomorrow, then I'll do this, and that can turn into worry. Um, so we're continually fearful of or worried about dying. So... <clears throat> that's, that's a good question. I, I like the question. Um, I would, the way I would answer it is I'd back up one step and I'd say, are you worried about dying? Or are you afraid of dying? Because if you have no fear or worry about dying, well, if I'm here, I'm here. If I'm not, I'm not. For me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. Yeah. You know, just quote Paul. Um, but can it turn into worry? I can see where it turned into worry a couple of ways. If our plans, if, if we're really adamant about our plans, well, what if we're not here to do what we plan to do? And we start worrying about it. You know, we, we were going to go do this next week, and what if we're gone? And, and then a little bit of anxiety comes and so forth. Um, yeah, that would be the wrong approach. It's like, well, if we're not here next week, I don't think it matters. You know, I don't think we'll care. Um, it's, it's the whole concept, I think what James is trying to say is place more emphasis on the eternal perspective than our temporal plans. Amen. So that as we're planning for eternity, or as we're planning for tomorrow, we're not thinking just tomorrow, physically only. But we're actually, you know what? We may not be here tomorrow. But if we are, this is what we're going to do. If we're not, I'm ready. Got everything in order. Um, Told the wife where I hid the cash, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> ready to pull the trigger, ready to go. Uh, nothing to worry about. If I'm here, well, I'm going to keep going. If I'm not, well, then I have to make sure I'm done with what I was here for to the best of my ability. And that is something that I think is a help as we look with an eternal perspective because we, we lose some procrastination if we take it seriously. We're not just procrastinating, saying, oh, I'll get to it next week. What if you're not here next week? You better get to it now. And not just procrastinate and push off. Um, and, you know, everybody does that in certain areas of life. But if, if we're not ready to die, I could see where worry could kick in. We just need to be ready. So I haven't finished this yet or I haven't finished that yet. Well, is it something that is really important? Is it important to those who are going to be left? Is it important to eternity? If it's really important, you better get on it and finish it. If it's not really important, well, maybe you're making a bigger deal out of it than it you know, really is. So it gives us a weighing measurement. But yeah, we shouldn't get into worry. We shouldn't get into fear. Just do your job, make sure you're ready to roll, and go on with life. Good question, though. So let's, let's I think this is the last message, so let's kind of finish up the last thought. 
And I won't go back and review much just to make sure we have time for the last thought because I want to open it for some questions because there might be some things that people ask concerning this. And that is this. You know, we've got the scripture. We started with 1 Thessalonians 4 where it talks about uh, we should not sorrow as those who have no hope. We as Christians should have a different perspective on physical death because the people that are dying around us are going to heaven. We'll see them again. We'll be together for eternity. That's kind of what we talked to this point. But there's one more thing we need to talk about. What if they didn't go to heaven? Because there's lots of people who are not going to heaven. Might be our friends, might be in our family, children, spouses. There's lots of people aren't going to heaven. So when they die, how do we view that? <clears throat> do we go into horrible grief because there's no hope? What, what do we do with that? The first time I was introduced with that thought, which is really, again, being a minister and being on this side of the fence, so to speak, there's a lot of stuff the church and ministers do wrong. <laughs> me, me, me included. But once I got into the ministry and started facing some things from this side of the fence, I first realized how much we're doing wrong. For instance, this question. What do you do for someone who, they went to hell? How do you handle that? I grew up in church. I went through Bible school. Nobody ever talked about that. Why don't we talk about these kind of things? It, it's like, yeah, that, that, that was wrong. We should have dealt with this. I should have known that. I mean, we went to, I, I was back in the day when we went to three services a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then every fall and every spring, you'd have two weeks of special meetings, a special emphasis of some kind. And we never talked about this? Really? So we need to talk about it a little bit. The first, my first introduction to it was uh, from the man who taught me uh, or helped teach me, uh, helped tutor me, mentored me on uh, deliverance stuff. We, I'll never forget, we were talking one day, he was sitting in his favorite chair I was in his office with him sitting in his favorite chair and I was sitting here just kind of like a little bird sucking up the stuff and somehow this subject came up and he just made the statement he said yeah my brother's in hell and I'm going that it so floored me I was in the ministry it so floored me that someone would go yeah my brother's in hell it's a choice he made and I'm going what you know <laughs> What do you mean your brother's in hell? How do you know he's in hell? He said the last words coming out of his mouth when he died, I was there. He said he was cursing God. He said he's in hell. I said, so how do you deal with that? Because this was brand new to me. See, I'm, I'm like in my mid-20s already. This is the first time this subject has ever been broached for me where we discuss it. See, that should never happen. At least that's my memory, that this was the first, okay. He said, well, he said, <clears throat> he had all the opportunity to get saved. He said, I talked to him numerous times. He said, he just refused it. He wanted nothing to do with it. He said, I know he had other opportunities besides me. He said, he made his choice. Now he's going to have to deal with it. I said, doesn't bother you? He said, well... I'm not rejoicing over it. He says, but I have my job. I have my life. I have my choices. I have got to stay on track with what God's asked me to do. Getting all emotional and depressed and discouraged about a bad choice he made won't change his choice. It'll just stop me from doing what I'm here to do. And it's like, well, that's a good thought. So I had to chew on that and process that for a while. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I took that as advice because there's, you know, we don't know if, in that case, we're probably pretty sure he probably didn't make it. 
I mean, when you're, when you're in your dying breath, you're cursing God, chances are pretty strong. You're not going in. But there's a lot of people that die, you wonder. You know, did they make it? Did they not make it? So <clears throat> some of the best advice I can give is what he gave me. He said, that's why, and we had talked about it a while, and he said, that's why Scripture says we're supposed to make sure everybody knows the choice. It's our job to evangelize. It's our, whether they want to hear it or don't want to hear it. Some point, they have to be fed the information. There's an eternity coming, and you're choosing one way or the other. You're going to have to make a choice on this. <clears throat> um, he said, but once that is off of us, he said, now we're free and we're clean. So I thought, well, that's good advice, and, and don't get caught in grief. Don't get bitter at God. Don't get angry. Don't, don't get into depression feeling bad for them because it's not going to help them anyway. They made their choice. But is there some scriptures that deals with, well, a person's lost and they die? Well, if you read David in the Psalms, <laughs> he almost rejoices when the wicked die. It's like, you know, I know he's pre-cross and so forth, but it's like... David, I mean, woohoo! They're burning today. You know, it's almost like that that philosophy coming from him from time to time. So it's like, well, I, yeah, that I don't know if we should take that attitude necessarily, but it's the attitude. I mean, when you read the psalm, you've read them, you you know, and the wicked will perish, and they will, and he he's just like, he, 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 you're getting there, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, that's probably not what we should be doing. So since that conversation with uh, the man, I, I had, I, I've just been kind of reading the scripture, trying to keep my eyes open of what is a good perspective on our part who are still living for someone who's died and has gone on. And <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot in there. I, I, if there is, I haven't, it's, it's escaped me. It hasn't come out to me yet. I will give you a couple of thoughts from the scripture concerning this. Ezekiel 3 is, I believe, the first place that I want to talk just a bit. If you can bring this up, I'm in the New King James Version, Ezekiel 3, uh, verse 18. As far as I know, this did not go away at the cross. Remember, when you look at something in the Old Testament, you always have to use a lens. The lens is this. Did it? Because you got the cross between the Old Testament and us, and a lot changed at the death and resurrection of Jesus. So something in the Old Testament, did it stop at the cross? Because there's a lot of stuff that stopped. It, just, it didn't carry on past Jesus. It stopped. Some stuff changed at the cross like for instance the working of the holy spirit the holy spirit was in the old testament and he was doing all kinds of things but that totally changed with the death and resurrection of jesus christ because now it's not just the prophets who the spirit comes upon but the spirit actually lives in all of us and it's a whole different program but it's the same holy spirit and it's the same holy spirit working with people so that changed at the cross and then some things come through the cross unchanged like, for instance, the rainbow that we see every summer for two days that we have summer here. <laughs> the rainbow started way back in early Genesis, thousands of years ago. And that came through the cross unchanged. That is God's covenant mark that says, I'll never send another flood that covers the whole earth again. That hasn't changed. That's, that's the same. So there are certain things that, you know, Deal with So you always have to look at something from the Old Testament from that filter. Did it come through the cross? Did it not? To my knowledge, this set of scriptures came through the cross unchanged. It's, it's talked about in various ways in the New Testament. <clears throat> so verse 18, we'll start at Ezekiel 3, verse 18. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, and he's speaking to Ezekiel here now, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. 
that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So if somebody dies who's unsaved and we did nothing, I don't know how this is going to work, but somehow we will be held accountable for their loss or their eternal death because we did nothing. We didn't give them the choice. Their blood is on our hands. Verse 19, yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So our job is to put the message out. If we refuse to do that and someone dies and goes to hell, their blood is on our hands. We did not preach the gospel. If we put the message out and they still choose against God, we've delivered our own soul. And then he goes on and he talks about a righteous man and makes some applications there. Um, there is a difference in how... Now, how that works, I don't know, and that's just kind of a wake-up call for our job is to give them the choice. Now, in America, it used to be most people knew. That's not true anymore, uh, especially the younger generation. I, it, there's, I, I, I don't have figures on it, but there's a lot of children and junior highs. I don't know if it reaches into the teens or where where it's at it it the first experience we had with it when we were doing uh, is when we were doing foster care in Colorado so this would have been back about the mid 90s and i think this was an exception to the rule at that point in time but we had a couple of children come to our house they came uh they stayed with us for a while and they came uh early December, mid-December, something in that, we had a nativity scene set up in front of our house. And they walked by the nativity scene a few times and just kind of looked at it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You're just kind of looking at it. Well, then one, one time when we were walking by, the girl said, what's the deal with the kid laying in, in, in the thing there? And Mary said, well, that's, that's baby Jesus. Who's Jesus? That's back in mid-90s. Now, it could have been more of an exception to the rule back then, but I tell you what, from the experiences we're having now, there's a lot of children the adults have told nothing about God because they are not paying any attention to God. And Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus. It's Santa Claus. And it's that realm. And, uh, you know, Bonnie can probably attest to this because she teaches some of the, uh, the, the children's class at TVO on Saturday nights. So there you're getting more of a cross-section of what the world is like now. Here you get more of a cross-section of Christians because most people that come to Word of Life are already saved. At TBO, you get a good, healthy input of unbelievers all the time. And these kids know nothing. Yeah, they, they know nothing about God. They know nothing about the Bible. They know nothing. So you bring up the name Jesus. Who's Jesus? Uh, so that is a failure on our part. And their blood will be held on our hands if we've had the opportunity to share something with them when we refuse to do it or just chose not to do it. Somehow we're going to be held accountable for that. Um, I will say this. When we leave our bodies, our mentality is going to be different in heaven than it is here. Go to Revelation 17 with me. I want to show <clears throat> a couple of spots. I suppose we could do Revelation 17 first. I got uh, my mistake. It's Revelation 11, starting at verse 17. And <clears throat> the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up, this is happening in heaven, but it shows 
there is a different mentality when you get out of this flesh in this fallen condition. And as we're living to go there, we're encouraged to die to the flesh. There's so few places in Scripture that give us an insight into how do people think when they're there. Revelation gives us a few. This is one of them. And uh, so let's jump in at verse 16. And the 24 elders who sat before God and on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, so we're in heaven here now. We give you thanks, O Lord Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry. Verse 18, your wrath has come. The time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. It's almost like matter of fact. It's like here's what's happening and here's what's going down and some are going to be rewarded and some are going to be destroyed. <clears throat> Praise God. That, that is the approach that's being given right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, go to chapter 19, and we'll start right at the beginning in verse number 1. I think that's where I want it to be. Um, <clears throat> After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. So now here is the people of heaven. That was the 24 elders, that is, and from what we understand, the 24 elders is the, the 12 leaders of the Old Testament tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob, and then the New Testament apostles. So those are human beings that we just read about in chapter 11. <coughs> but here we have the voice of the multitude, the people saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. So they start out praising God because he judges. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged her blood on his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Hallelujah. Listen to the next phrase. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Her smoke rises forever and ever. That almost sounds like David now. She's cooking. Praise God. And the 24 elders, that's the two groups of 12, and the four living creatures, which never were human, they fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, so be it, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, he goes on and talks about a few things, but it, it, it's not the attitude so much anymore uh, that we're looking for here. So the attitude right here in the first few verses of Revelation 19 by both the 24 elders and the multitude of believers who are there is, yes, not only her, but those who served her, who were killing Christians, who were killing believers in God, are in hell. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You say, is that the attitude to have towards people who've died and gone to hell? Apparently, because it's in heaven where it's happening. So I bring those two sections of Scripture up to say this. They, once we're out of this fallen condition, we view this thing differently. If we didn't, everybody who is there now would be in depression, sorrow, sadness, emotional pain. They wouldn't be happy because everybody who's there now knows people who aren't there with them and they know where they're at. So there is a different approach of looking at this. Doesn't mean they don't care at all. But I think it's kind of the approach of what I was told as a young minister. God is fair. 
He makes sure everybody has their opportunity. Part of that is our job to make sure they have it. If they had their opportunity and they chose wrong, it's on them. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Do I feel bad for him? Yes. Is it going to take me down emotionally? Absolutely not. I will not let that happen. In heaven, it's like it does that, that thought or that possibility doesn't seem to even exist. It's like, hey, they're, they, they're big boys, big girls. They had their choice. They had their opportunity. And they chose wrong. Nothing we can do about it. You say, that's almost cold. <clears throat> to us in this fallen nature body. But they're doing it in heaven, so it can't be wrong. Right? Following me? So our thinking somehow is different than theirs. As long as we're on this earth in this body. Because once we get there, we're going to think like what is told there in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Again, I'm not sure I'm ready to go with David yet and rejoice over everybody who doesn't make it. Now, the blood on the hands thing. I don't know for sure how that's going to work, but I want to read a few verses to you out of Revelation 21. We'll start at the first verse. <clears throat> because there is some form of accounting and there is, there is some form of emotional distress over the lost and they're going to hell. Uh, verse 1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So here we go. The first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Everything's starting over. There was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city. This is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Now, this is interesting. It's just a side thought. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will. The tabernacle is a he? The tabernacle in the Old Testament was a place where they sacrificed, and, and the Holy of Holies was there, and, and the outer court, and, and all the, the paraphernalia was sacrificing. It wasn't a he, it was an it. Oh, not from God's perspective. That whole tabernacle was Jesus in pre-picture form of his sacrifice and everything that he was going to do on earth. Everything Jesus did on earth in the sacrifice and so forth was pictured in that tabernacle, and here it refers to the tabernacle as he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So that, uh, that's just a side thought. It's not pertaining really to what we're talking about, but it's, it's like obvious. Verse 4. So we've got the new heavens, the new earth. If you go back to the end of Revelation 20, you just had the white throne judgment where all kinds of people were judged and death and Hades, Hades being hell, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, last verse of chapter 20, verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I would presume we will all be there for that event. That is the main event in heaven at that point in time. There's nothing else really important that we know of going on when it comes to the white throne judgment. So you've got this scene that in reality is going to be a horrific scene. Because death and, and hell and the grave and the sea and everything gave up their dead, if you read through that. And the dead were judged according to the according to their works, by the things written in the books, verse 12, the sea gave up the dead, death and hell gave up the dead. So anybody who was lost shows up before the throne right here at the white throne judgment. And anybody who was lost beforehand, chances are good, are lost after they're judged. So we've got the bulk of the people going to hell for sure, or the lake of fire. Hell, hell is going to be cast the lake of fire. So this is a horrific scene. Then, verse 20, chapter 21, he saw a new heaven, new earth, awesome things taking place. It's, everything's made new. Verse 4 is an interesting verse, chapter 21. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is talking heaven. 
There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Why? Because he's making all things new. Verse 5, then he, he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. <clears throat> you say, what's that talking about? There will be some type of, I presume, remorse in heaven after the white throne judgment, seeing all these people end up in the lake of fire. And it's not going to be a rejoicing time. That could be when their blood is accounted on our hands. If we're standing there in the crowds watching this, we're saved, we're in heaven, we're, we're good. But we're watching people we lived with on this earth. We're watching family members. We're watching people come through this white throne judgment and we know where they're going That is not going to be a happy time for us. And just look at it this this how I kind of look at it. Just the realization of I failed them if I didn't talk to them at all. Now, if Ezekiel 3, if I, if I was working on them and they just refused, it's on them. My soul's delivered. But if I failed them because I refused to tell them for whatever reason, I didn't want to get them upset, didn't want to break up the family, you know how they whine and complain about God and church if we bring it up, and you've got all these excuses, and now they're headed out the door to go to hell, and they look back and give you one last look and say, thanks a lot. You know the remorse and the pain we're going to have? So what's God going to do? He's going to wipe away all tears from the eyes. Most scholars believe what that means is, yes, it's the physical wiping away, but it goes deeper. How do you wipe away tears and keep them gone? The former things have passed away, the end of that verse. Memories. We're going to forget these people. We're going to forget this earth. It would be difficult to go on in heaven future feeling good about things, knowing our spouse or our children are in the lake of fire. He is going to erase. The former things have passed away. He's going to erase our memory of the former things, and with that, the tears will dry up. Um. But that's future. That's still coming. And if we're seeing it right, you know, we, we try to see through a glass darkly and try to see clearly. Sometimes we don't always see it right. If we're seeing it right, that's how it's going to play out there. How do we process death of someone that we're pretty sure went to hell here? Well, number one, if we're living with an eternal perspective, we should have said something to them while they were still here. That's our job. That's what God is expecting us to do. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves, am I, am I trying to win the people who appear to me who don't know Jesus or have a relationship with him? Am I working on this? If I'm not, we're not living by an eternal perspective. Our job is as long as they have breath... Pray and believe God will somehow open a situation, a time, a place where we can speak in to their life in a very direct manner of are you ready for the future, for eternity? If you were going to die, are you ready to go to heaven? That's our job. We need to do that because if and when they do die, which is pretty sure at some point they will, it's off of us. And we can stand looking in their casket saying, I don't know for sure where they went, but I did everything I could to make sure they went to the right place. If they went to the wrong place, that's their decision. That's on them. Because that's the attitude heaven takes. And I believe it's the attitude we're supposed to strive for. Because if we get caught in grief, if we get caught in depression in sorrow it will destroy the work we're supposed to do while we're here 
So people go down, and it is what it is. I mean, that, that's, it is what it is. You're not going to change it. They made their choice.